Hello, everybody, and welcome to Virtual TrekCon 5 with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. And Mr. Matt Boardman, of course. Hey, hey. Yeah. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we have a very, very special guest. We've got a concept illustrator and designer. It's Mr. John Eaves. What's up, John? Hey. Thanks for having me on today. We're very excited. We're so freaking thrilled. He's worked on so many projects. It's insane. We're not going to be able to cover all of them, but we're going to try. For uh, all the Star Trek fans' purposes, just to name a few, we've got Deep Space Nine, Enterprise, Discovery, Picard, and like eight movies. So the most <laughs> impressive thing, just right off the bat, if we can just jump into this, John, for me... The most impressive thing is usually you have people that worked on old Star Trek. And then you also have people that worked on newer Star Trek. Or you have pe some people that worked on old Star Trek and new Star Trek. But I've never seen anybody that's worked on the older stuff, you know, Deep Space Nine, Enterprise, things like that, and things like Picard and Discovery. But also some of the new movies and the older movies, it's like, do you? Re I don't think there's anybody I know that has actually worked on every kind of generation of Star Trek. Is that something you ever think about? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it was a. I think it's just a. I make good copy, so they keep hiring me. But uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. But uh, I've just been very, very lucky. I've, I've met a lot of wonderful people, and uh, uh, for like example, the JJ movies. There was a rule for the very first one that nobody from the previous Star Treks were supposed to work on the new show because they didn't want it, uh, anyone to influence the, the thought process. Right. They wanted to be brand new. And um, I had met Scott Chambliss early on when he was doing Mission Impossible. And uh, they were already crewed up. And he goes, hey, we have Star Trek coming up if you want to join us. And I go, oh, that'd be great fun. And so he calls me and he goes, I'd love to hire you. Are you available? Then he calls back an hour later and he goes, I can't hire you. We have this rule in place. And I go, oh, so it was kind of a bummer. But about six months into it, he calls. He goes, we had to let some people go. They moved to other shows. And he goes, if you promise not to be influenced by what you did before and just do what I ask you to, uh, we'll give you a test. So he gave me a test, and um, they hid me in the uh, transportation trailer, which uh, is kind of a... <laughs> <laughs> they were saying it was pretty scary. The drivers, they're really scary people. And I went in there, the funnest guys in the world. But he kind of hid me away. And I passed the test, thankfully. And I just did what he asked for. So it was uh, a blessing. Then after that, I got to carry on with the other ones. That rule went away. But yeah, I started out with Greg Jean on the fifth movie. So I got to work with the original cast and the crew. And and um, I transitioned from hands-on physical models to the art department right after that one. So good, good times. Wow. Been a long time too. That was '88. Started on that. Yeah, John, we've had a, a new appreciation uh, for the artists that are involved in Star Trek, from animation to the art department to just all the artwork that's involved. And um, there's no difference here because I am definitely interested to know about, you know, your inspiration as an artist and how you were able to manifest that skill set into Star Trek. Ah, well, it was funny. I uh, always wanted to be an, an artist. I was inspired by Ron Cobb and Sid Mead in the 70s. And, uh, you know, back then they didn't have the art books uh, or the um, the Internet and stuff. So we had to rely on Starlog and Cinefax and learn about all our stuff from these guys. And, and at the time um, Star Wars came out, it really opened the door. So Ron Cobb's artwork would come out and then Sid Mead and, uh, Joe Johnson, all those wonderful guys from Star Wars and Blade Runner. And they were really a big influence to me. And, and, um, uh, I always wanted to get in that, but I was a big, a, a visual effects fan. So I, I bothered all the visual effects places, Boss Film and Apogee in the uh, <laughs> early eighties. And finally they hired me on a show. Top Gun wanted to be up my first movie, but um, uh, I would draw a little bit, but I didn't draw that well. I didn't have schooling. I kind of taught myself and I could draw to a point, which was okay. But for some reason, making models was a, it was a hidden education uh, because you're working with your hands, you know, and you, you build everything from every side and every view. And when I got my first drawing job that had like translated 
uh, kind of within. And so when I when I met Herman, he asked me to draw some spaceships for him and Greg Jean. And I go, sure. So I started drawing. And I go, wow, I couldn't do this four or five years ago. And it, and, and it really made me happy that I could actually draw something and maybe possibly <laughs> get into the art department. And so um, learned from a lot of people around me. Uh, Tim Flattery uh, was a, an enormous influence when I met him and his work and a lot of the guys over at Amblin. Ed Barrow was a huge hero. And um, they were very gracious to help me. Uh, get into the to the artwork and to this day i'm still a pencil artist and they say uh for some reason they still hire me i don't know why <laughs> but i'm the only one that still does it in a way but uh I, the influence comes from aircraft it comes from everything and um it just depends on the look of it and there's a difference between star trek now and when like we were doing deep space nine because you know when we were at paramount costumes was over here and makeup was over here. And we all had that interaction. If we had a question, we'd go ask the writer himself. Hey, Ron Moore, what do you want to see on this? Or, And uh, he'd go, oh, I hadn't thought about that. And, you know, now we work from home and you don't have that interaction. And this place is all scattered all over the place. Um, but it was nice to be able to have that experience when it was around. And uh, it's almost like scary to call the other departments now <laughs> because you don't know if it, you're allowed to. But um, <laughs> uh, along the way, there have been so many people that have just influenced the artwork uh, or what I do. And sitting in the room, Ryan Church and uh, Jim, Cl or, uh, Jim Klein, all those guys, just amazing. Like, like the stuff Matt does, even though it's not hands-on artistic, but his models, you know, his model work is so cool. And uh, I, I, you learn from everybody and everything. If you if you open up your mind to it, so incredible amount of influence everywhere you look. John, you mentioned my mind. Uh, What's it? Yeah. Oh no. Go ahead, now. I was just going to say that blows my mind that when you first started drawing, that you didn't think you were very good at it, or that it wasn't a, a talent that you were born with, because it's like your pencil drawings. I mean, we always kind of joked, you know, that <laughs> that you have a printer for a brain, because I mean, your <laughs> your pencil work is so beautiful and 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 your concept art is just it's always amazing so i just figured that that was a you know one of those talents that you were born with that you know whenever they were assembling you you you're like i would like the artist plug-in so can i take that and it just was already part of your brain <laughs> well it's funny because working in the model shop and working in the prop department and they would get the drawings you know from the art department and they'd always grab, like, why can't these guys draw something that I can build? It's so ethereal. And I thought, shoot, if I ever get the art department, I want to make sure that you can build it from, from my horrible little drawings. And so, <laughs> so you know, I'm always thinking of the model makers and the prop guys that are the next guy that gets it, the VFX guy. Will they be able to use these drawings to help them, or will it just be something they'll, they'll, they'll curse my name for? Can, can you walk us through that transition there, at least in the early stages? of getting a drawing from the art department, what are the model makers, like, what do they start with? How do they start in that process? Oh, uh, for, for instance, we were doing a show that Sid Mead was doing the artwork for, and the art, art director wanted Sid Mead badly, so they hired him for three or four days, and Sid uses construction lines to show the flow, like it was so, uh, the device went on an arm, so we had these flow lines, that basically were just showing the direction of the way the forearm works and stuff. And so when we got that drawing to make the model, uh, we start building it. And when we get the prop done, the uh, art director looks at it and goes, well, what about these lines? And we go, well, those are just, they're, they're not part of the prop. They're a part of the flow to show the way the arm goes. And he didn't differentiate between those two things. Mm -hmm. And so we had to apply those lines, which only work from one point of view. So when you turn the prop, you know, the lines don't line up anywhere, but he insisted that if Sid drew it, we had to build it. And so there was an education there that, okay, don't use, leave your construction lines on because somebody might think that's a part of what you got to do. But um, it was always fun. It was always fun to get those drawings. And a lot of times you had to interpret what wasn't there. And when we were doing um, the Batman with um, Jim Carrey as the Riddler, we had to make the insane asylum. And all we got was a silhouette of what Arkham Asylum looked like. And they gave us kind of free reign to make the building from that. And uh, 
And so we had some guys that were really good with, with the artwork. And so we interpreted it. We did some sketches and stuff. So what you, if you get a little bit, you can interpret it if they let you. Or they give you full-on views and everything. It makes it easier. But uh, no matter what you get, you can make it work. So always good times. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, John, I want to point out um, that you've worked, again, on several movies here. But just so that the fans uh, at home no, at least for me, one of the greatest contributions uh, you have given to Star Trek or contributed to was in the movie, what was it, First Contact, which is, for my money, the best Star Trek movie. I know some people will disagree with me, but you designed the USS Enterprise E. Mm -hmm. um, that is something <laughs> that you can really hang on to for basically the rest of your life. You know, there are certain things that certain people do or contribute to the Star Trek world. I'm sure that is not lost on you, that contribution. When when you were doing it, did you give that any thought or is that something more in hindsight that you realize what a momentous contribution that was? But, you know, it was very scary when that came across. I had just started drawing, didn't know how to do it even mediocrely, I thought, but uh, Herman comes up and goes, we have to do a new enterprise. And he goes, and um, I go, are we going to use the D and do the initial? Because back then it was, it was miniatures and Star Trek was a very small budget and um, models were very expensive to make physical models because you had to hire motion control. You had to do opticals. You had to do all kinds of stuff. It was a very, that's why you don't see a lot of model ships in the early space nine days in the earlier shows because they could, it was too big of a financial endeavor. But when that enterprise came, I, I was thinking when Herman asked me, I go, oh, this is way out of my league to do this. I'm, I'm more <laughs> like drawing shoes or tablets or something. But uh, but uh, he gave me that task. And so we talked talked it through. It was in the holidays. And um, I didn't realize at the time when he asked for it, I started doing sketches of it. And he goes, it's a battleship. It's not a family ship. So I started drawing it with a short nasals like Andy had done with the D. I was trying to carry his architecture forward. And Herman comes up and goes, oh, you don't have to do short because this we're not, we're doing cinematic. It's not TV. And I didn't realize that the D was formatted for TV, so it fit on the screen. Oh, really? And so, and that's oh. why it had a shorter it's kind of more stout file as opposed to a long one, because the format of TV in the in the 80s was, you know, 13 inches. It was a big TV. And so he goes, we're doing cinematic, so you can go back to the to the longer uh, profile. And, you know, it needed that because it didn't balance right. And that was another thing I was, I was kind of talking about with the uh, mechanics. When I was working with the facts, the Enterprise D model would always be on set, would have to repair it. And uh, a camera would hit it or something, and the cameraman would always kind of throw a fit, like, why is this model so hard to photograph? Because you know it has the big saucer and the smaller body and the nacelles. There's only a few angles that make it work right. Otherwise, the proportion looks wrong, depending on what the angle is. And they were they were throwing a fit about how to film this and make it look right. And um, the same thing I threw. I go, well, if I had to do an enterprise, I'd try and make it worth nice from every point of view, from a camera point of view. And it was just a, it. I didn't mean it to be. What it wound up being, I know it, it, it's, you know, you draw a lot of ships all day, but an enterprise is like a big deal. And there was a lot of help, but the, the Akutas helped out, Doug and Drexler helped out. Everyone in the room was like pitching ideas, helping out. And so I'm drawing this, this shape. And um, we thought immediately with that, since the battleship, what are the weak areas? And the neck was the big area, I thought, because, you know, Wrath of Khan, when uh, Khan is shooting the side of the, the, strut for the that uh, connects the hull to then the saucer so two more shots he's going to separate that it's going to be blown out and the an enterprise will be useless and i thought in a big board battle that would be the first place to shoot it so that's why there's mm. no neck so we made it a, a very thin profile so it's a harder target to hit and so it had a lot of that in the background on it and then uh so i did a steady model the sketches and stuff they got approved and then ilm finished the magic with it and it wasn't for uh, John Dole and Bill George and John Goodson, it wouldn't be the ship it was. Those guys added where I had to leave off. And so it was a great collaboration between all of us. Just wonderful stuff. 
Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's such a beautiful, beautiful, sleek ship. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. and, and for anybody who's who's listening and watching, John, I think your blog is still up and uh, eavesdroppings. Um, you know what? I ran out. Of, I ran out of room on that, and they wanted oh, to try fortune to put more pictures up, so it ended. <laughs> like oh, I think. Yeah. But there's there's still some really really cool drawings, and and I remember some posts about uh, the process of of designing the E. Like at one point, you had the. Um, I mean, we ended with the the nacelle struts swept back, which helps. I mean, that the, the ship looks fast sitting still as it is with those swept back nacelles. But at one point, you had them kind of sweeping forward, and so it just it's it's a great great uh, resource if you if anybody is curious about reading up on on some of John's process as he went through the designing of the ship. Yeah, we were trying dropping. That's such a great name. ideas. With with that with those struts, and there was a, a an air or this particular jet at, at NASA Dryden I saw, and it had the wings were strep, swept forward, and it was really cool. I don't I don't think it was past the experimental stage, but I saw that. And I go, that's pretty cool. Let's mess around with, with our struts on the Enterprise, and it didn't look right when we did it, and it was kind of going through a couple of iterations. Well, let's try this, try this, and Fritz, who's uh, Herman's son. Looking at it goes, oh, looks like a turkey. Thanks for even turkey in a pan. And that's all we needed to play. Okay, if it looks like that, we got to move on. So we're all kind of waiting for <laughs> some reason to not carry out that design process anymore. So Fritz saved the day. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, I'm looking at pictures of it here. And that that's, you know, you, you said you're not a, much of an artist, but you certainly turn out some great work. And I like yep. the way that you reverse engineer a lot of your thinking. You, you talked about if I was in the art department, I I would draw it in a way so that there was no mistakes when it, you know it gets the build. Um, then you just mentioned here about dra- designing the ship so that it was functional for camera angles. And so uh, to me, that's like taking the problems and figuring out how to make solutions so that you don't even run into those problems going forward and that just shows me the kind of you know the mind and the approach that you take to uh design and build and so that's that's wonderful uh can you talk a little bit about you know you know my personal favorite star trek which is deep space nine and and coming in in season four and you know what that was like coming in and on that show and 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 working on those really the bulk of the really good seasons for our show Oh, yeah, certainly. And uh, one thing I was just going to add in is, if you've, have you heard of an artist named Brian Froud? He's an a English artist. He's the one Jim Henson hired to do uh, Dark Crystal in the lab. Heard of him and heard of that. And he <laughs> did a little video, and I heard him talking. I hadn't worked in Hollywood yet. And um, he made this little comedy. He goes, he goes, I draw things rough. I don't want to finish the drawing because someone's going to take it after I'm done doing the sketch. And if I, he goes, if I draw it too complete, the next guy that gets it can't add their creativity to it. And so I always tried, I thought that's the coolest thing in the world. So I always try to apply that. So when I draw something, I try to keep it open. So the next set of hands that gets on it isn't just copying, but they can be artistic and creative too. You know, that's what makes the collaboration fun is, mm-hmm. is having all everybody put their thoughts and ideas into the, what you'll get to see on the screen. So it's always cool. But with Deep Space Nine, it was very interesting because we shared movies. It was uh, Herman Zimmerman was our designer and so when we got first contact, we're doing Deep Space Nine in the morning and first contact in the afternoon. And that's the way it went all the way through uh, Nemesis. We were on Enterprise and did Nemesis in the afternoon. <laughs> but uh, oh, wow. Deep Space Nine was was wonderful. Uh, I got I took. Yeah, Jim do you Martin. wear a different hat? Do you, you, you clock yeah, in and clock hat. back out? <laughs> <laughs> the, Jim, the Jim Martin was the illustrator on Deep Space Nine, and he wanted to move on to movie, so an opening came up, and I, I I took his spot. He wanted to do Alien Alien Four, and so he made that big movie transition quite well. But he left a beautiful architectural footprint footprint behind that I could kind of follow his design patterns, how he did it. Just a brilliant. He's one of the artists I wanted to mention earlier mm-hmm. who inspired me. He introduced me to the blue pencil, which I'd never heard of before. And, uh, but he, blue had, pencil? You know, yeah, there, uh, back in the day, you, um, uh, you know, you, you, you have to ink your drawings and then color them with marker. And, uh, if you drew 
in ink and you made a mistake, you were in trouble. So he designed everything in a blue pencil. <laughs> Excuse me, quick drink. Mm -hmm. And we had the Xerox copiers at the time. Excuse me. And uh, the copiers would not pick up the blue pencil. So oh. you could draw your drawing, your ink over top of the blue pencil, put it in the copier, and the blue would drop away. Then you have this beautiful black line drawing you could do your markers on. And it was just, just the way the machinery worked at the time. But the pencil stuck, and I, I still use it. But uh, that was a thing I learned from Jim. And um, uh, from there, would you, you'd take it to the marker, so, and uh, sometimes you'd scan it through the computer and print it so, and stuff. So the designs that Jim came up with, would that include like uh, the promenade and, and some of the interior of the ships? And yeah, uh, he and uh, Ricardo Delgado were the two illustrators. Rick Sternbach had started and mm -hmm. moved to Voyager. And those two guys kind of, they're both kind of comic uh, book artisan style, especially Ricardo. And that kind of spilled over to Jim style where you do the heavy black shading and stuff. And uh, just just remarkable talent these guys are. And so we'd have all their artwork laid there. So when I started in the art department, I'd see Jim stuff, and Ricardo stuff. I was like, oh my gosh, these guys are incredible. And so um, the primary job, when I started was to make props for Joe Wongo, the prop guy. And then mm -hmm. uh, ships and sets and all that was kind of secondary. But um, Joe was fun. He was, he was a very unique individual where he was very frownish and cranky. <laughs> I'm sure you yeah. know on stage. Yeah, I know. But, uh, but he was a, a sweet part of a guy. And, uh, I love Joe. Uh, yeah, you knew deep down he was... He, he was <laughs> he looked like one of the main guys from Goodfellas, though. Like, he could be in Goodfellas <laughs> easily. Yeah, exactly. And so to, to, to make him happy was really hard. And so you could make it a challenge. But uh, but he was cool. And um, and uh, But Deep Fish was really fun. It was a great way to draw a lot of stuff. Because, you know, uh, what was a TV show back then? Seven-day turnaround for production before you filmed? Seven or yeah. eight days. And yeah. then you'd start something new. So you're constantly learning new things if you're like a new artist like i was you couldn't have asked for a better it was like going to school but uh with a bazillion projects to do every couple of hours and uh, like i said having it, everyone around you was very unique in the education what was fun about mike akuda being he was officers behind me what he would do is he'd work with costumes and when we get a new alien race he'd design a logo it'd either be if the aliens were kind of pleasant it'd have rounded shapes to it but they were kind of an aggressive that have angular shapes and i would mm -hmm. kind of tee off what he would do with that logo so if i'm doing props or ships or anything for costumes i would use his what he came up with first is where i would kind of carry on from and the same with costumes with bob blackman when he's doing the costume you go over and see what they're doing what fabric are you going to use he goes, oh, i got this great leopard style stuff and and so you'd base your colors of the ships and stuff on what he was doing with the costumes. And so it was really a unique family, the way that worked. And Deep Space Nine was such a unique gift to all of us. I think not yeah. only the, the wonderful writers and the acting in the shows, but just the way everyone interacted. I didn't ever see anyone that had an ego or someone you couldn't approach and talk to in any department, the producers all the way down. I just thought it was really cool, really unique. Um, world to work in and start off. Can you, can you talk a little bit about Far Beyond the Stars? Because you mentioned you did a lot of work on that episode. Yeah, that's one of your favorites. And that was that was an interesting one because um, if, uh, if I recall, he Avery directed it as well. And uh, yeah. what it was, it's a flashback episode where uh, uh, Cisco was taken back into the past, into the 1950s, where there's segregation in a, in in the world where everyone is, is uh, either a victim or, or pitied upon by race and, and tortured. But he gets in this position to work in a, in kind of a sci-fi novel thing. And the way it works in the, in the, is they get a pile of drawings, they throw them out. Who wants this? Who wants that? And then they write a story around what the drawing is. So he gets a prehistoric drawing of what Deep Space Nine would look like in comic book form in the 50s. Jim Vanover yeah. did the, did a real rough model of it, and so I did my drawings based on what he did. But we did all kinds of wonderful stuff, because we had to set decorate his, his room, as well as the publishing office. And everyone went nuts, so we remade old 50s 
sci-fi novels that didn't exist. And we did all the beautiful decorations in Cisco's apartment, like the cycles of the moon and all this beautiful stuff, things that I never got to draw before. And Laura Richards, the set decorator, she just gave us a list of stuff. She goes, if you have time, could you do this, do this, and that? I need it for Cisco's room. I'm like, oh, gosh, yeah. So uh, I can't even think past the stuff we did. Besides the moon drawings, we did the uh, the comic drawings. Oh, it was unbelievable. Just an amount, amazing amount so of stuff. So fun. In every department. Yeah. Just go nuts making that room. And what was funny, it, it, I never met Jerry Ryan before. I never knew anyone on Voyager. but. There's a scene where where Cisco drops the drawing, blows on the wind, and a cop steps on it, stomps on the drawing. And we needed to have the drawings pre-stomped on. And so uh, they were filming, I think, the Nazi version, one of the Nazi shows with Voyager. And I saw Jerry standing there with those big, giant 1940 shoes. And I walked up and go, hey, could you stomp on these drawings for me? I need a footprint right here. So she stomped on all the drawings in the alley before they filmed their scenes. And I took him over and Jim Van Over saw it. He goes, oh, what are you talking about Jerry Ryan with? I go, Who, who's that? I just asked that lady over there to stop all my drugs. <laughs> she had these cool oh, wow. And so oh, when you see the show, that's Jerry's footprint. That's uh, in the middle of the drop. Oh, drawing. wow. That is a deep, deep, deep <laughs> cut. Yeah. <right> there. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Thanks for that story. That that's pretty <laughs> fun. Uh, and those drawings are very prominent in the episode. I mean, it's one of the things that when I you know think back of the episode, I can literally see the mm -hmm. sketches of Deep Space Nine in my head and and those drawings. Um, that is fantastic. You mentioned Michael Lakuda a lot. Um, there was a lot of like chemistry with him uh, on the set working. Oh yeah, they uh, they were they're just wonderful. You know, the whole art department was such a, a wonderful group, and they uh, they welcomed me in into their family right away. Which you, you know, when you start somewhere new, you wonder if you'll 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 fit in with everybody. And they were like ridiculously kind and sweet and nice, and uh, a lot of things in common. And they, and they didn't just stay friends in the art department. We did stuff after coffee and all that stuff. So it was really a wonderful group. And and. Um, and, and Mike would take like not a fatherly role, but he would take a, a very kind of educational presence because they wrote all the uh, encyclopedias and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'd hear Herman say stuff. We need something that's Kardashian. And I'm going, what's Kardashian? And Mike would come out and go, in case you don't know what Kardashian is, he'd open up the encyclopedia. He goes, this is the race. This is what they look like. Uh, you can use this. And so he gave me one of his encyclopedias. And so uh, he he was always right there. And I'd go visit him often. I'd go, Mike, what would you suggest? And he would say this or that. And then you'd hear Doug Drexler and the other one. I wouldn't do that. And I'd do this instead. And, 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 and all the guys in there, they were they were wonderful. And so uh, uh, you couldn't have asked for a better set of hands around you to make sure you're doing everything the way it should be. Mm -hmm. so, and Star Trek has such a history and such an architectural base from the beginning to the end and that's something mike always tried to do which was really cool is try to carry the architecture and the then the the art tones from the original series into where we are because it's supposed to be the the trek past obviously but he tried to carry that so there's always little bits and pieces so you'd refer to they go oh i think i saw something like that the original series or in the next generation and that was that was mike's doing and so um, after Nemesis, they kind of moved on and I started kept doing other tracks. So I tried to keep that in line with what I did always to try and carry what was we saw in the original series in what we're doing into the newer shows, just to keep that, that line of, of uh, architecture tied in, in, in no matter. Sometimes it would make it, sometimes it wouldn't. And you never know from a fan's point of view if they saw they and they're, they were referring to that when they're watching the shows. Oh, that's mm -hmm. cool. I saw something like that in this episode or that episode. So, but it's yeah, there. But it's always there if you, if you know what you're looking for. You know, John, along those lines, the, you know, normally we would think it's great to have kind of that backbone or that spine of Star Trek, that through line that goes from one series to the next series to the next series. But then I wonder for like shows, for example, like Discovery, which is completely different like the designs are totally different deliberately so it feels you know updated and much more modern and and series hadn't been going for whatever it was you know 
13 or 15 years or something. So it's really interesting to hear you talk about like keeping like the the, the slight similarities and, and bringing those in. But were there any conversations specifically, for example, like with Discovery about modernizing these designs or about starting fresh or about resetting your artistic mind? Was there anything like that? That was a very interesting show. Mark Worthington was the production designer. And um, he had called and brought me on the show with a bunch of other guys. And Matt was on it. And there was a weird VFX. I don't know what happened. They were working. And all of a sudden, they were all kicked off and gone. And another group moved in. And we never knew why. Matt, I don't even think Matt knows why. But they were working oh, on it. I know. I know. <laughs> that's, 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 that's a conversation for off camera. <laughs> for, that's for things <laughs> left unsaid. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, it, was, it was an oddity because they kept having re- crewing of the show and so it kept changing okay. obviously the art department stayed because we, we you know we're working from home so we're invisible so when they do these big crew changes we'd wait till the new people came in <laughs> oh, hey, we were Perfect. on this before you started um and i'm, I'm trying to remember the, the show runner's name that started do you remember who was the first uh, show was brian fuller brian fuller, fuller. He had yeah. a very unique vision of what he wanted discovery to look like and he brought out the, the Ralph McQuarrie and the Ken Adams drawings. And he goes, I want the Discovery to look like this. And it was a rejected ship from the 70s from a, a show they were working on. And so that was a challenge in its own. And so immediately we started doing sketches. And I did round A cells because it was supposed to be 10 years before Captain Kirk. And so we had Enterprise, which is several decades before that. So we established that architecture that round A cells were how it started. The Phoenix has round A cells, the NX-01. And so we got the discovery, started drawing that way. And Brian saw those and he goes, I want to see something different. I don't want round A cells. And I was like, oh my gosh, how are we going to tie the architecture together? Because that's mm -hmm. everyone knows that's where it should go. And so he threw that challenge at us. And we're sitting there trying to figure out what to do. We had, I think, 12 ships we had to do immediately for the Armada, the first few shows. And Brian really liked flat ships. He liked things that were very, very skinny in profile. And we had to do a lot of them. And and so I was talking. Uh, Mark moved on with, with one of those changes, Mark Worthington. And Todd Chernowski came in. He was the art director for Mark. And so he became the new production designer. We're trying to figure out what, how can we explain these ships that look so drastically different than what they should really look like. And I pitched the idea like, oh, what if you treat it like it's Edwards Air Force Base in the 40s, where every company is competing to make the first plane that goes faster than the speed of sound? Hmm. I mean, everyone's making their own ideas. They all look vastly different, but they have the same goal in the end. And I go, what do you say we treat the ships like that? This is an experimental stage where they've broken away from the Balkans. They're, now it's the uh, Federation's designs that are trying to do. They're trying to figure out the nacelles. We had the... Uh, the, the um, the spore drive, all these weird things going on. So Todd goes, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. So we named the classes of all the ships after space pioneers. So you have the Jaeger class after Chuck Jaeger. You got the Cardenas after Robert Cardenas. We have the uh, Amelia Earhart class. All these classes, Arthur C. Clarke, they're all named after the pioneers. And we thought maybe we can get away with it that way, that this was just a stepping stone area of experimentation. So That's brilliant. Uh, it didn't go anywhere, but at least in the art department, we had a, a, a backbone of what we would draw from. And uh, when we got the Enterprise, <clears throat> at the end of Discovery, we were trying to think it should be like one step away from what the uh, Jeffrey's ship looked like in Captain Kirk. We knew it was just 10 years away. So uh, we took on that project, Doug Drexler, I mean, uh, Scott Schneider, he was an old model maker, and he's a brilliant CG guy, and, and Todd Janowski gave us the project, who goes, okay, make it a little bit different, but it's a precursor to that ship. And so we drew it in a way where it'd be a retrofit from the Jeffrey ship, so you just took things off of it, and it would be the Jeffrey ship. And uh, so we finished it, finished the model, set it away, and we forgot that we're not the last hands to touch it. We kind of forgot our own set of rules. <laughs> so it went away, went to digital effects. And when the episode aired, it was the first time we saw it, it the nasal straps were angled back. And we're going, oh my gosh, what happened? And because uh, somewhere 
that design element had changed and it kind of breached the 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 uh, the architecture from uh, the Vic, or the uh, Matt Jeffrey ship to the refit from the motion picture. So it made this kind of architectural breach of what it should be. And I remember Scott and I were looking at it going, wow, what, what happened after it left our hands? But like I said, you kind of forget that you're not the last hands to touch it to these, you know, on the, on the air. But in the original designs, that's the way it was. So we're always trying to keep, like I said, we're always trying to keep that that architecture on an even line. And sometimes it makes it, sometimes it doesn't. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the final ship turned out really, it, it's very, very beautiful. The effects does that really Does that even line also apply to um the props that you make like the you know stuff that people are holding in their hands whether it's a tricorder or a, some kind of phaser yeah some sometimes you know the phasers especially because they're well known when it's an alien race you have a lot more free reign but if you're trying to keep it in line because uh when you look at phasers and shuttlecraft it's the type 11 or the type 15 so you know you're following a, a bit of a lineage and so uh, especially with those two shuttles and phasers you're trying mm-hmm. to keep line you got to modernize them of course for the newer shows well i noticed that, actually yeah. these these nacelles on the e look very reminiscent of phaser rifles you know federation phaser rifles when i saw these that's the first thing i thought yeah very very much so not intentionally but uh they that that <laughs> uh that, that line has turned into a phaser rifle in the future so <laughs> go, let's mark it back and use that a little bit so <laughs> I remember, John, I remember there was one night that uh, I forget what I think it was when we were working on the Comic Con trailer and you were still, you know, trying to get uh, doing drawings. And I saw that you were online and it was like 1230 in the morning and I sent you a message. And I was like, John, what are you doing? And you were like, I'm drawing the cells over here. I, I've got to have like, I forget how many drawings you said. I have to have those for, for a meeting in the morning. I just thought. <laughs> Oh yeah, you know it, it. It's funny you get the ship shape done fairly quickly, and now the the hard thing to approve is the nacelles. You'll do more nacelles than ship drawings, and uh, I'd say for Discovery, we were over a hundred different ideas with those nacelles, and they just went back and forth, long, short, fat, stubby, things that had mechanical elements that would then open at the close. It was unbelievable the amount of stuff that went into that. And I think the very last note we got, we're at the end. It had to. They had to choose one, and it was those long ones, those really, really long ones. And uh, I think Brian had asked me, he goes, I want some really long nacelles. And so we made those exaggeratedly long ones, and uh, that's the one that made it. But it was uh, that that seems to be the hard thing out. It was the same with uh, <laughs> Picard. It was the same with uh, the second season of Discovery. It's just that's that's the, the hard part to get approved, <laughs> the nacelles, so. I think wow. even Probert had some trouble with his Enterprise D uh, nacelles, where he had the, it's like he had them really short and stubby, but then at one point they added a little bit of extra bit on the end there too. So yeah, I guess it's it's a uh, it's a universal constant that uh, the nacelles are the hardest part. They certainly are, and uh, it, it's funny talking about things that you try to tie in that don't make it. Like Andy's uh, version of the Enterprise C, I think is my favorite, the one that didn't make it. And uh, I remember you worked really hard on that design. It's beautiful. If you haven't seen it, just research uh, um, Andy Probert's Enterprise C, the, the rejected sketch. And it's like, what a beautiful ship. And um, and uh, I think it, it wound up being that they had to make something in the model shop. And I, I want to say Greg Jean might have been involved. And in, when if you give Greg permission to make a ship, he'll use what he has in the shop. If you, if you don't give him a hard design, he'll make something up. And, and uh He's he's wickedly wonderful at it, and uh, so I, I'm not sure how the artwork worked between Andy's drawing and what the model was, but uh, pretty amazing stuff. Is this what we're talking about here? Let's pull this up. Yeah, I think didn't uh, didn't Rick uh, Sternbug? I think I think he got. You know, Rick might have taken the project after. Yeah, I think I think that's what that, that's why we ended up with the uh, ambassador class as we did versus. Andy's more uh, curved. Um, yeah, know. he was trying to like tie in a transition between the C and the D, and uh, and that kind of reflected. And like, uh, I don't know if that model reflects the artwork that they are that three D model, but um, it's beautiful when you when you see his drawing. You go, wow, that's yeah. pretty. Yeah, yeah. It's like well, a we're talking about a sketch. It. Yeah, there's some there's some drawings of it out there of it. Okay. So, but, but while looking. Ryan's looking that up, John, <laughs> you talked about early <laughs> on 
um, you, you know, you talked about making a good good cup of coffee. And uh, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, John is he's a wonderful practical joker. And I wonder if you could talk to us <laughs> about fish coffee. <laughs> yeah. Fish coffee. Well, I have to tell you, working in the model shop is like working with carpenters. You get punched in the arm and you people play jokes on you all the time. And when I moved to the art department, I didn't realize they're they don't like that stuff <laughs> at all. <laughs> they're they're not that type of hands-on joking type. But I, I it was like the first couple of weeks I'm working late and I ordered a, a pizza and I got the wrong one. It was covered with anchovies. Yeah. And I went, Oh my gosh, what do we do with all these anchovies? And Fritz we, it was the old coffee part. We put the grinds in the in the uh, in the in the holder in the in the filter, and then you'd stick it in the coffee pot in the morning, and be in the refrigerator. So I buried all those anchovies under the, the coffee. And Fritz comes in the morning, puts it in the machine, and I'm kind of <laughs> rubbing my hands. Going, this is going to be fun. You and it didn't stink. smell it really. You didn't. I feel like the whole it didn't, room it would didn't, fill it up didn't with didn't smell slick. like I was expecting, but it made a slick, a grease slick on top of the pot. So he pours yeah. a cup. Oh my gosh, what is this horrible trash? And I start laughing. And I go, <laughs> and so so we'd sit back and watch everyone come in. I was first, always first in the office, then Fritz, and then other people would come next. And uh, oh gosh, I can't remember, but one of our direct art directors came in, Randy McElvey. And he picks up a copy, he has a sip. And you know the theater mask face where one's got the smile, the other one has the frown. Mm -hmm. He made that exact frown. <laughs> he goes, what is this? <laughs> But he drank the whole cup. Yeah. It, take, woo, it, 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 it was gone when Doug Drexler came in and he comes over to my desk and he goes, all right, here you put fish in the coffee. And I go, yeah. And he goes, you should be very lucky I didn't drink it. I already picked you till you were dead. <laughs> you know, there are a lot that's of Star Trek fans right now that are thinking, that's, that's Antedian coffee. It's just for oh, Antedians. Oh, yeah. <laughs> food, food. That's when, that's when Drexler and I became great friends was after the coffee trick because he didn't drink it so <laughs> he just heard <laughs> well uh i do want to blank i do also want to ask you an eclipse here yeah the sun's definitely coming in there uh john besides star trek i do want to touch on very quickly so many other really cool things because i myself being a nerd a big time hardcore dork i see a lot of cool nerdy shows uh, and movies like Cowboys and Aliens, which I immediately when I, I remember when I first saw the billboard, my first thought was the pitch meeting where they say, all right, we got a movie idea called Cowboys and Aliens. And the execs were like, what's it about? And they're like, Cowboys and Aliens sold. I mean, I thought that was like the best idea I've ever heard. But also a ton of Marvel stuff like Captain America, uh, Spider-Man, Guardians of the Galaxy, Ant-Man and Wasp. Uh, also WandaVision, things like the uh, Watchmen, Godzilla, The Dark Crystal. What the heck? That is so much. Uh, when you get to the, the 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 one, I was waiting for the Terminator 2, bro. There's Come too on, many man. to name them all. You got to there... put that in there. It's like That's one of the very greatest true. of all times. Is there, <laughs> was there ever any moments, John, where you were just like, oh my God, besides Star Trek, where it like hits you like an anvil on the head, like, whoa, I'm working on Iron Man or I'm working on Terminator 2 or whatever it happened to be. Yeah, Red October was one of them. But I was a, a huge, huge fan of John Carpenter. And I, 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 I always would call up and ask if they were doing anything. And I, and I timed it just right. And they were doing a movie called Ghost of Mars. And it's kind of just a long, bloody rock video if you watch it now. But um, I always wanted to work with Carpenter. I got to work with them on that. And he's such a cool, unique director, the way he works. And I was like so excited and uh, to work on it. And uh, it's not a great movie to watch, but it's still one of my favorite movies I ever worked on. But he, the way he sees things is shadows. And so I showed him mm. some of the first drawings of this Martian landscape we're doing the architecture. And he goes, boy, that building would cast a pretty cool shadow. And they said it about a second one. And I go, oh, he's all about what kind of shadow is this going to cast? Because he hides his his creatures in the shadows. And so from then, I drew everything based on what kind of shadow it would cast and immediately found out that's exactly what he was looking for. So when we have our meetings, oh, I like this, 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 and that, because look at that cool shadow. And um, he was so fun. And, you know, he scores his own movies, too, does the music. 
And so um, I asked my when did they, we were done. I go, can I come watch you score the film? So he let me come down and watch him do it on the synthesizer. And he had a band called Anthrax come in. Anthrax? Uh, Anthrax. Was in it? I didn't know that. They, they're, the, uh, they're the rock side of the soundtrack. So yeah. John's doing the synthesizer and Anthrax comes and does the heavy rock score. That's, uh, That's pretty they, cool. Some little place called Cherokee Studio on, I want to say Fairfax maybe. And it was oh. cool. Very, very fun. So I was excited about that. And, if I'd ever get to work on a Mad Max, that I would jump in a second to do it. <laughs> but, uh, the, the, the Marvel ones are fun. Terminator 2 was, was fun to a point. Sequest. <laughs> Sequest. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Sequest was great fun. And uh, that was cool. I was always a Spielberg fan. And, and so uh, I got on to that. I don't know how, but I got on to <laughs> it. And uh, it was great fun. The first time I worked at a studio. Universal was just a blast every day at lunch. I'd go explore the lot and good, good times. So, so how much time did you spend um, working with uh, directors or writers, uh, you know, on a project? Usually not that much with the directors. I'm usually with the designer, production designer, and he does everything. He'll go to the meetings. Sometimes I'll go to the meetings, not too often, because uh, usually the, low, the, the visual effects shows are so heavy. Spending two or three hours in a meeting every day kills that drawing time. And so uh, uh, when we did the first JJ Star Trek, Russell Bobbitt was the prop uh, designer. And after I did a few ships with Scott, he sent me to work with with uh, Russell. And that's how that whole Marvel world started. Russell did Cowboys and Aliens, so he invited me out of that. And then he got the Marvel gigs. He became like the lead prop man for all the Marvel shows. So he would bring in prop designers for some shows and he'd take four or five at a time. And so that's why we'd would stack them, like WandaVision and and uh uh all the all the Loki, all the TV shows were on top of each other. So he'd be doing all of those and I'd be drawing for him and, and uh but they're fun. They're all out of Atlanta. Great place to go, great restaurants and barbecue. God mm-hmm. couldn't couldn't ever say no to Atlanta. But uh <laughs> good times. And so He's really taken me on on all of those adventures with him, which has been I, I can't even think of enough how fun that's been. But wow, good time. You Lots know, John, it's it's funny because when I was um, you know reading your bio, one of the things it mentions is working at a a grocery store, uh, and I just thought that was interesting that you left that in, and I thought it was good to just see that you were able to manifest the life that you have now starting from this grocery store you know and can you talk just a little bit about your your beginnings there oh yeah the, you know, that was my first job as a grocery store i turned 16 and they hired me at this place called bayless it was an arizona chain been there since like the early 1900s and uh i was there almost seven years and you know the customers were wonderful and all the people we worked for all our managers and stuff and just that interaction with with everybody it, it, it was kind of the same with movies you know you, it, everyone's really the same down at heart i go you got people that you work for and people you're working with mm-hmm. and and uh and uh you know bad customers you have good customers and that would make make or break your day. And same with work, you know, you get a bad director or a good director and depending on how they handle the bad things, either they yell at you or they're very easy going, you know, look at Jonathan Franks, you know, he never gets mad. And I'm like, even on a bad day, he knows everyone else is working to solve the problem. So just, uh, just the personalities are wonderful. And, uh, with the grocery store, I learned a lot, learning to work with people, um, seeing, solution problems that would come up how to take care of them would not make a mess and and so it was wonderful it was a good thing i almost made it a full-time career because i was driving to hollywood at least every other month to take portfolios and stuff up and try and get in and uh, my boss was always cool take the day off go to hollywood drop your stuff off i know you have to do it a weekday when they're there and uh cool it was really cool a cool Mm -hmm. chapter in like the grocery store so can't say enough good things about it Good boss is super important when it's a tough job. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And that was well, in the day. That's a great story. When, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was going to say that was in the day too when when grocery stores would close early the the night before Thanksgiving, the night before Christmas, and they'd be closed. You know, no one ever was open during a holiday. 
And so uh, that changed immediately when I got to California. I go, wow, I can go shopping on Christmas Day. I can go get groceries on <laughs> Thanksgiving Day in California. So it was a whole different world when I got out there. It was 85 when I moved to California. So it was a walk, eye-opening experience for sure. Yeah. I thought I, when you story. said when you said 85, my first thought was degrees. I didn't realize you meant years. So when you said it was 85, I'm like, sounds like November around here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <It's not 85. laughs> yep. Well, John, this has been so much fun. I can't believe how many things you've done in your life. And uh, we could talk to you for like three more hours. There's so much more to discuss, but we're out of time for today. Uh, you, you've lived an incredible life. Looking forward to much more. Oh, also, you you do uh, some of these pencil sketches. Can we talk about uh, your commissions just for a second before we go? Oh, sure. Uh -huh. These right here th for the guy that says his his sketches are mediocre at best or something like oh, that. Whoa. Right? Look how gorgeous these so are. Beautiful. That's a pencil. Yeah, it's a white pencil. And so yeah, here's the that's the tablet. Yeah, so it's like a cardstock. It's really great stuff, wow. and uh, these fabulous white pencils. So it's always good. If people want to commission you for these, where can they uh, find you for those? I kind of just put it up on my Facebook page when I have openings. I go, I have ten openings, of, and I try to do it uh, every other month or so. And uh, the requests are getting very very complicated <laughs> it used to be just a little <laughs> ship or something and uh I, I think matt started the the, the trend of uh, two things on one drawing so <laughs> two submarines and two jets oh, and, I saw and so uh, but uh, <laughs> I, I actually it. learned this from i was when i started working at uh, fantasy two they were a vision flex company they did all the jim cameron stuff in the day they did the original terminator and when we started on terminator 2 i got hired over there but they had a drawing on gray paper of the the hunter killer tank jim cameron drew it and he was great card with white and black pencil and very little line work but because you were on a different color background than white it was like the coolest thing in the world and so when i started doing these commissions people always ask at the conventions when we do them do you draw pictures for if people request and um, I pitched it on the black paper with the very first one because that white pencil, it, it really is a, a, it makes everything kind of stand out. It, it's a, it's a kind of a poppy technique. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of pop to it. And so uh, yeah. it, it, everyone seems to like them and they're really happy with them and they make a lot of fun requests. So it keeps the pencil hand working and uh, it's a lot of fun. It's really are you measuring these sure things that. out? Or are you just, is that all freehand, John, when you're doing that, let the bird of prey, for example, or? Yeah, it's, all, it's, that... all, it's all it's all free high. There, there's the the strike right. from card, and uh, yeah. uh, a lot of times, a lot of chips that they'll request. I don't really have a lot of knowledge on, so I'll have to pull out the Eagle Moss model or something to use mm -hmm. details and stuff. But uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll do. Uh, I try to do a progress. I'll do a quick basic sketch of the layout, and I'll post it. And I'll go coming this afternoon a little bit more, and it will be like a three post project from start to finish. And, and they're cool. They're, yeah. they're, they're really a lot of fun. And the size of trying to make them fit that paper sometimes is a, is a trick. And so they're, that's one of the ones where it wouldn't fit would be mm -hmm. showed the entire enterprise. So I went to this cinemat, uh, cinematic view and did the uh, the cropping. So it's uh, gorgeous. It, it, it's really fun. Gorgeous. Beautiful stuff. Beautiful wow. stuff. Wow. For a guy who says he's not a good artist. I know. It's not <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I look at my artwork and I go, I'm very happy. They, like I said, I, I keep getting hired. But uh, <laughs> like, like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Like for Angelo? For his talent. Like, we're <laughs> comparing you to it. Like People I said, are going to start asking you to draw on their ceilings. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, John, this has been so cool. We wrote, really hope to have you back again sometime. This has been an absolute honor. And there's so much more to discuss in uh, future dates. But thank you again for your time. We really appreciate it. Yeah, oh, thank it was you, wonderful. John. Like I said, I'm a fan of all your guys. So uh, great, great fun to hang out with you. Oh, thanks so much. It's Everybody at honor. home, thank you for hanging out with us. Isn't John freaking awesome? And special thanks to Matt Boardman for sitting in with us as well, dropping a yeah. lot of knowledge for us. Yeah, thanks for having uh, me. Totally. Stick around, everybody, and uh, thanks for hanging out with us on Virtual TrekCon 5. Hey, everybody. 
We're not quite done yet because as soon as we stopped hitting record, we were talking with John and he showed us something freaking amazing. Yeah. And we're like, we got to show everybody this thing. Uh, so, John, if you will, please, this is from your own computer here. All right, here we go. And there it is. And what this this is, we were just talking about this. This was kind of the first white pencil drawing I did on Blackboard, which kind of inspired the, the commissions later. But what this is, is uh, Avery asked for a particular drawing for this set wall. He goes, I, you know, I kind of like something that has like a cycle of the moon on it. Mm -hmm. And so Laura, you said that to Laura Richards, the uh, set decorator, and she and came in with the request. Far beyond the, the stars, the so stars. This is at the far beyond the stars. This isn't the episode Far Beyond the Stars, and yeah. uh, you can see it as a, his apartment. It, 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 it's it's on one particular wall, and they they film on that wall quite a bit, so you can see it. But uh, it, it's very imaginary. There was not, well, I wasn't internet savvy at all, so I got information from the library, and I kind of came up with this kind of Roman numeral. Mm -hmm chart that means absolutely nothing on this just, <laughs> yeah. the, movie, the illusions yeah. of the movies are in full full play right here that it's all imaginary <laughs> but uh so that's the cycle and you got this crazy roman numeral thing that makes it look scientific and uh you got the little quarter drawings on the bottom showing the two cycles so uh but it was fine it was a really cool project and uh ecliptic ecliptic de Hines, Hines, uh copper drove Umbra Terra. <laughs> I'm reading some of the, the words that are written on here. It's got yeah. your name on here. John Eves, 97. Uh, and you the Far Beyond the Stars title on the far right on the bottom. and uh, Oh, Far Beyond the Stars. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, yeah there bottom it is. right. Wow. And I don't what remember do what the of, uh, trip to the moon. All the numerals, I don't know what they stand for, the letters, but AZ on the second cycle of moon is for Arizona. That's my hometown. And so, mm -hmm. uh, oh, there you go. okay. <laughs> Too long PG ago to for Paul George. <laughs> Paul there George, that's right. That's yeah. the one. You get it. Well, uh, anyway, this is we... great. This is this is beautiful stuff. Well, I, I just wanted to, you know, see that so everybody can kind of enjoy some of that because I'm sure the camera pans by it in the episode, but it, there's no way you're going to see that much detail um, without looking at it in this kind of format, and to see the kind of detail that you put in, it's, it's just remarkable. I mentioned Michelangelo earlier. That that looked like some Da Vinci stuff, right? Yes. So, well, I actually uh, used him for reference. So he, <laughs> there, there, secretly, there is a lot of Da Vinci in there. So, <laughs> yeah, very good, very good. Cool. Thank well, you for thanks. That. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, and thanks for sticking around a little longer because we're like, hang on a second. We have got to yeah. show this off. It looks so cool. Uh, thanks again so much, John, uh, and everybody at home. This time for sure. See you next time on Virtual Trek Con 5.